So good morning. Happy Sabbath. Please join me in prayer. Gracious Father God, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, as you have invited us to rest on this day, you also invited us to learn at your feet. And I pray that you would teach us now. I pray that uh, there would not be any distraction from whatever you want to tell us because we know that you love us and you want to uh, teach us the ways of salvation, uh, the path that we should uh, follow at this moment, especially as we see uh, the final events are taking place all around us very, very rapidly. Uh, may you give us uh, the spirit of discernment as we study your word. May you uh, help us uh, to see clearly what we need to do at this hour uh, so that we will not miss out on heaven. Uh, bless each one we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to take you to the book of Psalm chapter 46. Psalm chapter 46. And uh, since this is the Sabbath, and this is a time, this is a day that uh, we need to be thankful, uh, regardless of what we had gone through throughout the week. When this moment, when this day comes, uh, which reminds us of the creation account and the redemption account as well, what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, regardless of what we have gone through, uh, throughout the week, we, uh, we are reminded that this is a time to pause and to lay our burdens at the feet of the cross uh, because it was not meant for us to carry, you know, the burdens. It was meant for Jesus to carry. And he carried those burdens, those sins of ours 2,000 years ago. And so we are so thankful to God. I am so thankful to God for his grace and his mercy. As we begin this uh, study in the book of Psalm chapter 46, notice with me in verse 1. Speaking of burdens, speaking of Jesus being able to carry and did carry all our burdens 2,000 years ago, we read, God is our refuge and what else? And strength, a very present help in trouble. We need to remember those words. God is our refuge and strength. If we're going to rely on our own strength and on our own uh, ability to, to save ourselves, we are bound for destruction. We have to remember that God is our refuge and strength and a very present help in trouble. Therefore will I not we, oh, let me back up. Therefore will not we fear Though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah, there is a river, the streams thereof, whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Then it says in verse 5, God is in the midst of her. In the midst of what? What's the her? What is the her? Okay. All right. Tabernacle, his people. That's okay too. But this is referring to the city primarily. The city is the focus here. The city is the main subject here. Then it says, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her and that right early. God is in the midst of his people, in the midst of his city. God's people will find themselves in the midst of that city. Now, I would like to ask the question, which city is God referring to here? You see, some, especially among the evangelicals, they will take this passage and they will apply it to the literal modern day Israel as we know it or Jerusalem. They will say this is Jerusalem 
And they will apply, they will take this passage along with many other passages. They will say that after the rapture, God will bring salvation unto the Jews. God will be in the midst of the Jews. They will even use that passage to say that the 1,000 years that Revelation 20 talks about will take place here upon this earth when Christ will reign upon this earth for 1,000 years. And we're going to deal a little bit with all of that. And there is a connection here as well between those passages and the war that is taking place in Israel. You see, the whole world is a stage. The whole world is a stage. Satan begins this great controversy with a lie and it is ending with another major lie. The whole world has been duped, as they say. The whole world has been deceived. Jesus in Matthew 24 mentioned deception several times in that chapter there. We have this war that we are told that is going on right now with Hamas and Israel. But what if this whole thing was staged for all of us? To now focus on that little city there. That physical little city called Jerusalem. And meanwhile, while, we, while the whole world and even the Christian world are focusing on that little Jerusalem, the Bible tells us we as believers, we need to focus on the Jerusalem above. Where God dwells where his people will be, according to this passage here from the book of Psalm, will be, and God shall be in the midst of her, in the midst of his people, in the midst of Jerusalem. You see, Satan has introduced so many counterfeit, so many distractions to keep our eyes not only off of Jesus, but from the fulfillment of, of prophecies. Now, I'm going to play a clip for you. Now, in the, in the very short part of that clip, there is a little bit of indecency, and I apologize in advance, but I want to play this and to show you how the world is a stage. Is a stage. Keep in mind, the war versus uh, between Hamas and Israel, Palestine and Israel. We keep that in mind. The whole thing has been planned. As I'm, I'm about to play that clip for you, I remove the sound from that clip and then I will uh, talk a little bit about it. Let's play the clip. Let's go ahead and play it. Notice on the screen. This was a Madonna performance. This was way back in 2019. And one of the dancers there, as you can see on the, on the floor there, is wearing, what kind of flag is that? That's a Palestinian. And notice as they continue, you can see everybody there is wearing masks. You notice that? Everybody's wearing masks. And then this person here has a Israel flag. That's on that same stage. And everybody, one more time, is wearing masks. Remember, this was 2019. What are they telling you here? 2019, right before the pestilence poison came, and, and then now you have the Israel war going on, as you can see those two individuals, one wearing on his back the Israel flag, and then the other one, the Palestinian flag. Messages right on the screen, right before you. And as we just saw this, and I'm asking the question, then, who is the true Israel of today? Because the world wants us to focus, they want all of us to focus our attention on the physical Israel today. On the physical Jerusalem today. And many, the majority of Christians, they bought into this lie from the Jesuit of all those false prophecies that they have taken from the Bible and applied them 
to modern day Israel and then now to keep us away from the true events that are taking place, the true issues, and also keep in mind all of those misinterpretations, or I should say the way the Jesuits reinterpreted those prophecies and has given them to Protestantism is to also cause us to not know who the Antichrist is, which is the Pope of Rome. But also, not just the Antichrist, but the most important thing is you will not know when Jesus comes. And in the midst of that comes the so-called rapture. And as I ask the question, let's begin here. Who is the true Israel of today? Let's go to the book of Galatians with me. Go to the book of Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. We are going to be dealing with also another false interpretation of prophecies, which is Gog and Magog. Galatians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Galatians chapter 6. Let's begin in verse 15 as we ask the question, who is the true Israel of today? Galatians chapter 6. Note carefully with me in verse 15. The Apostle Paul says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Now, in Christ Jesus, you have, if you are in Christ Jesus, you have to be a new creature. Doesn't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter if you come from Israel. Doesn't matter if you come from Russia. Doesn't matter if you come from Africa, Asia, Latin America. Doesn't matter where you come from. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are a new creature. Everybody is invited. The next verse even made that even clearer. As it says, and as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on, on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Notice carefully again, it says, upon the Israel of God. Question for you, is this referring to the little physical Israel as we know it today? You said no, why? Well, let's not go there. I, I agree, I agree they rejected Christ, but based on those two, give me the answer based on those two verses we, we read here. Why does the latter part of verse 16 not referring to the little physical Israel? You remember what verse 15 says? It says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. And as Paul also says elsewhere, there's neither Jew, Jews nor Greek. You remember that? There's neither the Jews nor Greeks nor Gentiles. Doesn't matter. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are a new creature. Doesn't matter which nation, which country you come from. And then as he went on to say one more time, and as many as walk according to this rule, as many, that is all, have been invited. Doesn't matter where they come from one more time. All have been invited as long as they are walking according to this rule. Peace be on them and mercy upon the Israel of God. When Paul says this, the Israel of God, he was not referring to a specific group of people. He was not referring to where he himself came from. He was referring to as many as would accept Christ as their personal savior, are the Israel of God. Let's compare this with Romans. Go backward to the book of Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. And let's begin by looking at verse 28. Romans 2, verse 28. Notice in Romans 2, verse 28, the Bible says, verse 28, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is, is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart 
in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of man but of God. Remember he mentioned circumcision or uncircumcision in the previous passage we looked at. Now he's expounding so to speak of who is a real Jew, who is the Israel of God that he mentioned in Galatians chapter 6 verse 16. He mentioned there he gave you the definition of who is the true Israel of God. He said one more time, but he is a Jew, verse 29, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. The key words there are in the spirit. Those are the key words. It's the same key words that we read in Revelation 11. As it was describing the nation that came up out of the bottomless pit, the power that came up out of the bottomless pit, it described that power when it says, spiritually speaking, as who were they? Egypt and Sodom, which represented atheism and licentiousness, right? Egypt and Sodom. So, on this side of Jordan, so to speak, if I were to use this, on this side of Jordan, everything applies now, spiritually speaking. We're not dealing with a little nation anymore. And this is very important for not just Christians, other Christians out there, but seven Adventist Christians to understand because all of those things, they are tied in with the second coming of Jesus Christ. The manner of Christ coming is very important for us to understand. Let's move on. Notice on the screen with me what this tells us here. Let me back up. This says from CBN News, it always comes back to where? To Jerusalem. End times prophecy and the war against Hamas. The Bible predicted, they say, thousands of years ago that the end times events would revolve around Jerusalem. The Bible speaks of the regathering of Israel and then it speaks of a large force from her north attacking her. That force is identified as what? Magog. And Magog, according to their interpretation, is modern day Russia. How many times have you heard this? That Magog is modern day Russia. Is, Ma is Magog really modern day Russia? Now, what the evangelicals have done, again, the Jesuit deceived them with that understanding. They have taken Daniel 7, for example, the third, that Daniel 2nd, um, not the third, but the, the bear, you know the bear in Daniel chapter 7, which represented the Mids and the Persians? They said that, that bear now represents Russia. And God, according to them, represented the Muslim world that will go, Russia and the Muslim world, they will all come against Israel. Now again, the focus the reason why this is so important, Satan has deceived the world to cause them to focus on Israel, the little physical Israel and Jerusalem. While they will miss out on the real Jerusalem, which is the new Jerusalem, which is in heaven, which is the paradise of God, which will one day after, remember this, after the thousand years will come down from heaven will be here actually on this earth after Jesus make a plain valley for the city to come down. That's the Jerusalem that we need to focus on. And remember, that's where Christ is. And we are told we need to keep our eyes above where our redemption, Joreth 9. You see, Satan will come as an angel of light. He will personate Christ. He will come upon this earth. He will touch the ground when Christ will not touch the ground. 
Satan is causing everybody, even including some seven Adventists, to focus on what's happening in Jerusalem right now. As if this is fulfilling Bible prophecy. It's the same thing the evangelicals are talking about here. Gog and Magog. Let's continue. Notice on the screen. Next, it says, from the Christian Post, fasten your seatbelt. Pastor Greg Laurie talks potential fulfillment of Bible prophecy in Israel-Hamas war. Author Evangelist says, Jerusalem is the focal point of end time events. What a deception. Jerusalem, the physical little Jerusalem, is the focal point of end time event. That's a big deception, brothers and sisters. And I'll show you why. Let me one more time take you back to the Bible. Go to Galatians 4 this time. Notice carefully with me in Galatians chapter 4. And then again, as we are still answering the question, who is the true Israel? So according to those Protestants, that is the true Israel. Where Jerusalem, the physical Jerusalem, is at the present time. But is that so? Chapter 4 of the book of Galatians, notice carefully with me, in verse 25. Remember Jerusalem. They said, Jerusalem is the focal point of end times events. No, brothers and sisters. Let me make this point here before I read this passage. What the devil is also doing is causing the world to reject the true spiritual Israel. So that when the true spiritual Israel start proclaiming the message with a loud voice, they will be rejected. They will be seen as the enemy of state because Satan has caused the world to believe that the true Israel is over there. The true city is over there. Now, by the way, Walter White did a, a series on this. Those are not even true Israelites who are over there in the so-called Jerusalem. And let me make this other point. Did you know that the people, the main people who were behind the pestilence poison, the whole pestilence virus, did you know that they are all Jews? They are all Jews. The main people who were behind it, especially in the United States of America, uh, the, the Pfizer guy. Do you know who? He's Jew. Fauci, he's Jew. The, oh, um, the, um, what's the other company? The Moderna. CEO, Jews. All of those people are Jews. The people who are behind this men's flock, this massacre, they are all Jews. Let's, let's read that. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 4. Notice carefully, verse 25. It says, for this Agar... Let me back up, get some written. Verse 22, I mean some context. Verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons. The one by a bond maid, the other by a free woman. Now remember the word free woman and versus bond woman or bond maid. It says, but he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh. Who was that? Who was, who was born after? from the bond woman or Hagar here. That's Ishmael. Very good. That's Ishmael. Ishmael uh, represents whom today? Huh? Yeah, the, the Arab world, the Muslims, right? Let's continue. It says, was born of the, after the flesh. Latter part of verse 23 says, but he of the free woman was by promise. And who is he there from the free woman. That would be Isaac, right? That would be Isaac. But remember, Isaac here was a type of the seed, which is singular. And that seed is Jesus Christ. Let's continue. It says, verse 24, which things are in allegory for these are the two covenants the one from the mount sinai which gendereth 
to bondage, which is agar. For this agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and Ensereth to Jerusalem. Notice that agar, which is the bond woman, she Ensereth to whom? To Jerusalem. Question, which Jerusalem? Is it the Jerusalem above or the, the Jerusalem down here? That's the Jerusalem down here which is in bondage. Let's continue. It says, again, let me reread verse 25. It says, For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and Ensereth to Jerusalem, which now is, notice, it explains, which now is. That's referring to the physical Jerusalem. Then it says, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is what? Free which is the mother of us all. So we need to be of which mother? Is it Agar or the free woman? The free woman. If we are of that free woman, that means we are Abraham's seed. That was part of the Abraham's seed that was promised. Remember Abraham listened to Sarah and then she, she, he went ahead and 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 got Hagar, and then now as a result, they produce their worst enemies, so to speak. We are not supposed to be of that Jerusalem, which is in bondage. Now, let me compare this with Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Now, that will help us to understand the issue of Gog and Magog. Hebrews chapter 12. Notice in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Hebrews, chapter 12. I've heard this even among Adventists. They do not understand what God, the issue of Gog and Magog is really about. Listen carefully in Hebrews, chapter 12, what the Bible says, beginning in verse 22. But ye are come unto... Well, as a matter of fact, he was making the same... The same example that he made before that we read a moment ago but let's just read from verse 22 but ye are come unto mount zion and unto the city of the living god the heavenly jerusalem and to an immurable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven and to god the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect now question based on what we read here who will see and inherit the new jerusalem it mentioned the church of let me back up here it mentioned the church of the firstborn do you understand what that means the church of the firstborn do you understand what that means Okay, firstborn, firstborn, firstborn. Okay, you said Jesus. Remember, firstborn is also connected with first fruit. Firstborn is connected with first fruit. And what does that mean, first fruit? Well, I'm not going to the feast now. Remember in Revelation 14, the 144,000, they were called the first fruits. Why they were called first fruits? Can you tell me? Why? No, no, no. And this has something to do with Jacob. Why they were called the first fruit? It's because they overcame. Yeah. Because they were overcoming. Now, this is the key of Gog and Magog. This is the subject here of Gog and Magog, and I'm going to show you this in a moment. And you're going to see the misapplication of Gog and Magog as many evangelicals, even some Adventists, have made. Now go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, speaking of overcoming, Revelation chapter 3. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation 3, and look with me in verse 12. Well, let's back up to verse 11. Behold, Christ says, I come quickly, hold. That means you have to overcome. Hold that fast which thou hast, 
that no man take thy crown. Then verse 12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of God, of God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. What's the condition for us to see the city? The city of God. What's the condition? To overcome. That's the condition to see the city of God. Now keep that in mind as we move on. Notice, go to the next slide with me. Notice what it says there. In London, Jews hide their faith while Islamophobic graffiti targets Muslims. At the New London Synagogue in North London, Rabbi Jeremy Gordon says, some we, we regular congregants have stopped attending services, while some Jewish schools have told pupils not to wear outward identifiers of their religion. It's just a normalization of hate in their era. Now, do you get what's happening here? What they have created here, the power that we have created, is to start rallying people against a certain group. It will be a few in that group, which the Bible describes as the remnant church. They are building up hatred. You can see here that there's hatred on both sides, right? Hatred against Islam, hatred against the Jews, but ultimately it will come down to one. They are gathering those people, those groups eventually, for the battle of Armageddon. They are gathering them as well for Gog and Magog. It's a spiritual warfare. It's all a spiritual warfare. It's going to come down to this. Remember, the whole issue is about worship, worship, worship. So it has to do with our holy war. Because it's over worship, worship, worship. Whom are you going to worship? And this issue is coming down to us, as I showed last time. Notice carefully on the screen from the New York Post, October 14, 2023. NYPD, New York Police Department. Mother of three slain as scammer for wanting off on when? On Sabbath. A Brooklyn cop and Seventh-day Adventist was derided as a scammer after she requested to be off on Saturdays to worship. She spent the next eight years being chastised by superiors who allegedly told her what? You are not Jewish. Why are you practicing like you Jewish? Then it says, there is no place for her in the police department because of her what? Religion. So it's going to come down to whom? To Seventh-day Adventists. And it goes on to say, she was granted religious accommodations to have her required days off. But bosses told her other cops were angry a newbie would get a weekend day and begin criticizing her beliefs. That means criticizing seven Adventist beliefs. I don't understand your religion, one boss told her. Your religion is messed up. A supervisor also said that her religion was not for black people and she's starting being assigned to work Saturdays. It's going to come down to Seventh-day Adventists. We are already being seen as Jews, right? You're not a Jew. Why you are worshiping on Saturday? Again, it's going to come down to this holy war against those who keep the commandments of God versus those who keep the commandments of men. You see, brothers and sisters, persecution must come to the church. The church is due for persecution. And uh, what I'm about to say, it's not because I'm wishing this, but it's because it is needed. And what is that? Persecution is needed. Persecution is needed in the church. You know why? For several reasons why persecution is needed. Many of us are too at ease. We are too at ease. We have time, too much time in our hands. We have time to gossip. We have time to 
having bitterness in our heart against, against each other. We have so much time, we have forgotten to count our blessings. We have time to point fingers at somebody and saying this and that and the other. We have too much time in our hands. Persecution will open the door, will cause us to see how selfish we are, how selfish we have been. Persecution is due. The church needs persecution. We need to be persecuted right now. And I'm going to repeat that. We need to be persecuted. Because we don't know how much we need God. Because we don't know. Some of us don't realize how blessed we are. Yet we complain. When persecution comes and a hard time comes, then we're going to regret all those complaints. All of those bickering. All of those bitterness and forgiveness in our hearts. And all of those things. We're going to realize that we were blessed the whole time, but we could not see it because we allow Satan to cover our minds, our hearts with bitterness and many other things. And then when persecution comes, we're going to start looking for God. Where was God when things were good? Like when 9-11 happened. I remember taking a bus from... from uh, Brooklyn, New York, all the way down to uh, Albany, New York. Uh, and everywhere the bus will stop, you see the signs, God bless America, God bless America. Uh, yeah, now all of a sudden there was a revival. And then just a few short weeks later, everybody went back to business as usual. And I'm guilty of that because I was in the world at the time. I went back to, to business as usual. I, Manhattan, that's where I used to hang out. I, I would go back to party again. Just a few weeks after that, everything went back to normal. Like they say, New York is a city that never sleeps. But God was there all along. But God allowed things to come our way to, 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 to awake us. He doesn't want us to go through those things, to go through... Those tough times, but unfortunately, that's what it will take for some to be awakened. Sister White says something like this. Sister White says, just paraphrasing, that the, the reason why God allow tough times, hard times to come our way, it's because we don't realize how much not only we need Him, but we've been blessed all along, but yet... We were not focusing on our blessings. We were focusing on what we didn't get or what somebody else has done to me. And we have forgotten. You know, like the song says, count your blessing, name them one by one. See, if we are holding grudges, bitterness, and all kinds of things that are contrary to the fruit of the Spirit, when persecution comes, we will yield to Satan, we will yield. Many of us right now are on shaky ground. Many of us are on shaky ground and we are on already on borrowed time. And when that time comes, we will join the enemy. As Sister White says, speaking of persecution, notice on the screen, Great Controversy, page 48. The Apostle Paul declares that all that will live what? Godly in Christ Jesus shall do what? Suffer persecution. Why is it then, she asked the question, why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber? Answer, the only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standard and therefore awakens what? No opposition. So in other words, if we were living by what the Apostle Paul says, all that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, then we should have been persecuted right now. We should have been under persecution right now. Then how would some of us live? How would some of us handle this? Because according to what both Paul and Spirit of Prophecy says here, if we are living godly, we should be under persecution. But at the same time, we thank God that we are not being persecuted, hunting down right now. He gives us more time, right? He gives us more time. But what are we doing with the time? What are we doing with the time that God has given me? Has God, God has given us. What are we doing with it? Some of us have too much time in our hands. And some of us will never wake up 
will never come out of whatever it is that we allow ourselves to get into. We will never wake up until it's too late. And then there's going to be the cry. I knew that the judgment of God was in the land, was coming, but I did not know it, was come so, it would come so soon. And then there's going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth, as Jesus says. Because somebody thought that I should have been in the kingdom. I should have been saved. And here I am on the outside. Let me share with you a dream that I, that I had. This was some years ago. I had this dream. I was in Oregon at the time. I had a dream that uh, I was in Portland, Oregon. In the city there. For those of you who who uh, know Portland, you know it's surrounded by hills and down by the water. There's a, the bridge there. And while I was there, it was daytime, and all of a sudden, it started getting dark. And it it, it happened just like that. It got so dark that you could barely see in front of you. It was in the middle of the day. This cloud dark cloud came and covered the entire city and then i was there and and at, at the time i was doing bible work and when i say i was doing bible work at the time when i had the dream i was doing bible work in in the portland area i was a bible worker and uh then all of a sudden in the midst of the dark cloud there was an opening and there was some a little light coming out of it. And then everybody knew that this was supernatural. It was not natural. Something was about to happen. It was just a matter of what will it be when it's going to happen. Everybody was looking up. And then all of a sudden there was like flashing, lightning, and a bunch of things coming out of that little hole from that dark cloud. And People were dying from here and there, and it was flashing, throwing things upon the earth. There was chaos everywhere. There was chaos everywhere. And then I found myself there. And then I, people were running up the hill. And I was running up the hill, but nothing happened to me. But the whole time, I was saying, I was saying to myself, I, I was told we were not supposed to be in the city. And I'm in the city. I was told we were not supposed to, the whole time I'm running, I'm saying that. I was told we were not supposed to be in the city, and I'm in the city. And did you know that around that same time I had that dream, and I read online, many other Adventists were having the similar dreams, that a time like this was coming, and God wants his people to get ready. Because it will come, as Jesus, as Jesus says, as a thief in the night. When we think, this is one of the things that Satan is deceiving some of us to think. Some of us are, as Adventists. That, well, I'm an Adventist. I believe this and I believe that. So, I'm, I'm saved. But at the same time, we're not checking ourselves to see if we are in the faith. Yes, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But at the same time, the Bible says, if we confess, what will God do? He's faithful and just. To cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That means to forgive us, right? Of all, of all our sins. But if we refuse to confess, right? If you refuse to forgive, we are going to be lost. If we are holding grudges and bitterness, we are going to be lost. There's no other way. Could you imagine if Christ were to come right now? As we know, we're living the anti-typical day of atonement. If Christ were to come right now and find us in that condition... Can we say, oh, if, we, if God were to say, why are you holding, why unforgiveness, why this and that? Can you say, well, it's because she did something. Well, he did. Can you justify yourself with that? You cannot justify yourself with that. No, I'm not, uh, you cannot blame me for, you, for losing your salvation. Although I can play a part indirectly in that, right? But you still have a choice. The decision is up to you. You still have a choice. Let me go back to the screen. Finish the quote. It says, one more time, the only reason is that 
The church has conformed to the world standard and therefore awakens no opposition. The religion which is current in our day is not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. Really? That's our state now? So we don't reflect the true church? What does Revelation 12, 17 say? The remnant must reflect the original church. The dragon was wrought with the woman. The woman that's the original church. And went to make war with the remnant of a seed. Which keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. Why would the dragon do that? Make war with the remnant. It's because the dragon make, made war also with the woman. The, the mother. The original. Right? With the original church. Why? Because the remnant reflects. Must reflect the original church. So she said we're not even there yet. We don't reflect the original church. Let's continue. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there is so little vital godliness in the church that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. And then she says, let there be a revival of what? Faith and power of the which church? Early church. That same woman, the dragon made war against and what will happen? And the spirit of persecution will be what? Revived. And the fires of persecution will be rekindled. So that goes back to my point earlier on. The church needs persecution. Because the church needs to reflect the early church. The church today needs to reflect the early church. And the early church reflected the characteristics of Jesus Christ. You see it? And so, there's a lot more work to be done. Meanwhile, the prophecies are being fulfilled very, very rapidly. So that tells me, as we know, it's only a few of us that's going to make up the remnant. The faithful ones. Just a few. It will not be the majority of the church. And as they're coming after us, it's a religious war. Keep that in mind. Let's move on. Next on the screen. It says, from the natural news, Christian woman gets fired after what again? Jewish Ohio congressman accuse her of bigotry for sharing what? The gospel. This is one of the most bigoted tweets I have ever seen. That congressman said, Miller, rage in response before ordering her to delete her Christian proselytizing. Delete it, Lizzie. Religious freedom in the United States applies to every religion. You have gone too far. God says that what again? Jewish people are the chosen, chosen ones. Miller, a self-described proud Jew. Do you see the persecution there? Remember one more time. Most of those people that gave us the shamdemic crisis are Jews. The same way they hated Christ, they will hate true Christians in these last days. Are they really the chosen people? Remember what we read from Galatians earlier. Remember Paul says that it doesn't matter where you came from, what nation, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you are a Jew. You are Israel indeed. Notice on the screen to answer what this man said there. Who is the, the true Israel? We read from Genesis 32 verse 28. Here is the main focus here. We read, and he said, Thy name, that is God said, Thy name shall be called no more who? Jacob. But what? Israel, for as a prince has thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. Question now. As you read that passage from the screen, who is Israel? Who are the true Jews? Spiritually speaking, can you tell me, based on that verse? Thank you. Those who overcome, because the word prevail means overcome. What was the reason why Jacob's name was changed to Israel? 
And what does the name Israel mean? It means overcomer. That's one of the definitions. Overcomer. What was the reason why? Jacob was in his sin. But then he wrestled with God. What does that mean? Is it a physical wrestling with God? No. Jacob did not want to die in his sin. His brother was coming, Esau, was coming with his army to destroy him and his family. And Jacob knew it was because of something that he had done to the brother. And now Jacob was pleading with God, not because he did not want to die, but he did not want to die in his sin. He did not want to die in his sin. He did not want death to find him while he had unfinished business with his brother. When he did not confess that sin. Now, keep in mind, Jacob confessed that sin to God. You see, we confess our sins to God. Because it was God's law that he had broken. So he has to, had to go to God for forgiveness. So he did not want to die in his sin. This is the time, brothers and sisters, for, for seven Adventists. We need to wrestle with God privately. Wrestle with God personally. Wrestle with God. Because if we don't do this, you know what's going to happen? And I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But you're going to find yourself with the group, the Gog and Magog group, against God. Jacob's name was changed to Israel because he forsook sin. He overcame sin that night. He emptied himself out to God. That's why his name was called, was called now Israel. So, that is another passage that tells us those who are Israel today, they have not overcome. They have not chosen God or Christ as their personal Savior. Listen to what Spirit of Prophecy says here on the screen. Signs of the Times, May 20th, 1903. As an evidence that Jacob had been forgiven, his name was changed from one that was a reminder of what? Of his sin to one that commemorated his victory. What was the victory? Victory over what? Over self, over sin. Thy name, said the angel, shall be no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince that has power with God and with men and has prevailed. When we overcome, when we surrender all to God, you know, we become royalty. We become princesses princes of God. Wait, it's not me who said that. So It's a verse. It says, as a prince, that's what it says, as a prince has the power with God and with men and has prevailed. We become princesses. We become princes. We have overcome sin. Now we, be, we become uh, royalty. We have been adapted into the family of God. Notice another passage here on the screen. Notice carefully. This says from Romans 9 verses 6 through 8. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Notice seed again is singular. That is referring to Christ. Shall thy seed be called, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Who is that seed? Paul says, that seed was Christ. Those are the true Israelites today. And again, if we were to put all that together, definition of true Israel would be those who overcome. That's pretty much what it means. The definition of true Israel today are those who overcome. Overcomers. Those who overcome the flesh. Those who overcome sin. And let's even add Satan. Those three S's. Sin, self, and Satan. Let me put it in the other order. Self, sin, and Satan. 
in that order. Self, sin, and Satan. SSS. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what Spirit of Prophecy says. So who is the true Israel? Again, those who overcome. Let's go back to that article again. It goes on to say, Democrat Ohio Representative KC, who is also Jewish, rushed to Miller's defense and joined in his demand for Marbach, which is that lady in the center, to delete her proselytizing for Jesus Christ. Marbach refused to delete the post from social media, noting in a response to Miller that Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life, without whom one cannot come to the Father. No one has hope outside of Jesus Christ, and every knee will bow one day. And amen to that. It takes courage, brothers and sisters, to stand for Jesus Christ in these last days, to overcome the world. Now, let's move on. Notice the next article here from Israel 365 News, October 19th, 2023. Did the Hamas attack signal the beginning of Gog and Magog? Again, when you start applying those things, you have forsaken what it means to overcome. If you're going to believe that Jerusalem of today, the Jews of today, are the literal chosen people of God, then you don't know what it means to overcome sin, to overcome the flesh. Again, they ask the question back to the screen. Did the Hamas attack signal the beginning of Gog and Magog? The Hamas attack on Israel is threatening to be the spark that ignites the prophesied war of Gog and Magog, that pits the forces of good against the forces of evil as a prelude to the what? Messiah, messianic era. They're talking about the Jews Messiah. That's what they're talking about here. The war of Gog and Magog, which is predicted to come before the final redemption of the Jewish people. To come before the final re redemption of the Jewish people. When is that? They're talking about, based on those false prophecies, they're talking about doing the seven years of tribulation. After the so-called church is raptured. Oh, the church will be in heaven. No persecution for the church. And then the Antichrist, their misinterpretation of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, will establish his kingdom after in Jerusalem after the third temple is revealed. Now, this prophecy that they have taken out of context, let me take you there, is found in Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, 38. That's one of the passages. You'll find that in Ezekiel 38, in Ezekiel 39. Let's go there. Ezekiel 38. This is where we read about Gog and Magog. Notice carefully with me in Ezekiel chapter 38, reading about Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog, again, keep in mind that we have to overcome. And if we overcome by God's grace, you will understand what the issue is. You will see who are the Gogs and the Magogs in these last days. The Bible says, and the word of the Lord, verse 1, came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech, and Tubai, and prophesied against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord, God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Mesha and Tubal. This is one of the place, places that you read about. Now, let me, get you a, let me give you the context here. God says, I am against you, Gog, and the land of Magog. And then he said, skip on down to verse 7. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee. And be thou a God unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely 
all of them. Now, if I were to ask you here, which Israel is that mentioning, spiritually speaking? It's not the literal Israel. Let's continue. Then it says, Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages, I will go to them that are rest at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Now I'm going to connect the dot for you here and you're going to see the spiritual application. If you go to chapter 37 of Ezekiel, same book, you go to pre the previous chapter. You're going to read what the chapter was about, which chapter 38 follows shortly after. What was chapter 37 of Ezekiel describing? Well, let's, let's go back. The hand of the Lord, verse 1, was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of what? Bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy unto upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause, what is it? Breath to enter into you and ye shall live. Keep Remember those words. Now, Many of us have read this passage from Ezekiel. We have applied this in the form of revival, right? In the form of revival. But did you know that this passage is also even primarily describing the first resurrection? This is talking about the first resurrection. Notice the words, dry bones. This is talking about a bunch of dead body. And God says, I will put breath into you. That's a key there. This passage is dealing with primarily with the first resurrection. Listen carefully. It goes on to say, And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you. Remember the creation account. Adam was just formed. The body was there, but it did not become a living soul until God breathed into it. Just like it will be at the resurrection of the dead, based on what Paul also said, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's the same thing that will take place for those who died in Christ Jesus. Let's continue. It says, And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commended, and as prophesied, as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and a breath and breathe rather upon these slain that they may live so i prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army then he said unto me son of men these bones are the what whole house of israel behold they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost we are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. You see the first resurrection there? The land of Israel here is not referring to the little land that we know today. 
This is referring to the first. This takes us, you know, that the time period here is the resurrection, the beginning of the 1,000 years that Revelation 20 mentioned, and all the way to when Christ comes the third time. Second, second resurrection of the dead, with the wicked dead, and when Christ comes down with the new Jerusalem. This is the time period that this passage just mentioned here. From the first resurrection to the second resurrection. Oh, there's beauty there. Second resurrection. As a matter of fact, listen. Go to Ezekiel. Notice the, the beauty. Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 39. They go together. Go to chapter 39 now of the same book. Chapter 39 of the book of Ezekiel. Notice what the Bible says in chapter 39. Let's begin in verse 3 of chapter 39. It says, And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and I will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand, that shall fall upon the mountains of Israel. Now, what's the mountain of Israel? Do you know what that is? The mountain of Israel, this is another name for the New Jerusalem. This is another name for God's throne as well. The mountain of Israel, remember Isaiah 14? Satan says, I will ascend unto the mountain of God. Remember that? It says, Thou and all thine bands and the people that is with thee, I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured that shall fall upon the open field. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Notice, let's continue. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Behold, it is come and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. That prophecy also go along with Revelation 20. What does Revelation chapter 20 say? Go there with me. Revelation 20 verse 7. Let's read that. Again, Revelation 20 is dealing with the millennium. Revelation 20 is dealing with the millennium. Now you're going to see what Gog and Magog is. Revelation chapter 20, notice what the Bible says in verse 7. It says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is at the sand of the sea. It is the same thing we just read in a different way in Ezekiel chapter 39. Chapter 37 describes, you know, the valley of dry bones, the first resurrection. Now this is dealing with, chapter 39 deals with the second resurrection of the wicked. And Revelation 20 is dealing with the second resurrection of the wicked. After the thousand years, we are told. Then it went on to say in verse 9, And they went up on the breath of the earth and come past the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. What is the beloved city here? That is the new Jerusalem, not the Jerusalem as we know it. Notice carefully what Sister White had to say about this. Listen, she says, Remember Gog and Magog. I saw that Satan was loosed out of his prison. She's referring to Revelation 20. At the end of the 1,000 years, just at the time the wicked dead were raised, as we just read from verse 9. And that Satan deceived them by making them believe that they could take the holy city from the saints. The wicked all marched up around the camp of the saints with Satan at their head. And when they were ready to make an effort to take the city, the Almighty breathed from his high throne on the city a breath of devouring fire. We read that something similar in Ezekiel 39 as well. 
which came down on them and burned them up root and branch. Now remember the words root and branch. Notice it goes on to say, and I saw that as Christ is the vine and his children the branches, so Satan is the what? The root. And his children are the branches. And at the final destruction of Gog and Magog, the whole wicked host will be burned up, root and branch, and cease to exist. Then will appear the new heaven and the new earth. Then will the saints build houses and plant vineyards. I saw that all the righteous dead were raised by the voice of the Son of God at the first resurrection. And all that were raised at the second resurrection were burned up. So in other words, Gog and Magog have two applications here. And when will that be? When the wicked surround God's people. Before the first coming of Christ, they will do that. They will all come together, surround God's, God's people. And then they will do it again at the second coming. No, not the second coming, sorry. After the thousand years, rather. When they will again, based on Revelation 20, surround the city. So Gog and Magog is not happening now. It's not going to be against the physical Jerusalem as the Protestants are telling us. Notice, let's get some more context. Notice another one here from uh, our pioneers. There is a millennium revealed. It will be after the Lord shall have come. Raise the righteous, destroy the men of sin, and bound the devil. Again, referring to the beginning of the 1,000 years. They shall live and reign with Christ a thousand years. They shall be blessed and holy, having part in the first resurrection. Then they shall all know the Lord. God's people will be all righteous. Amen. There will be nothing to hurt or destroy in all God's holy mountain. Amen and amen. Still a doubt may linger in some humble inquire. As to Satan's being loose, based on Revelation 20, Gog and Magog who come up on the breath of the earth. So when will God and Magog be? What is God and the Magog? That's Revelation 20. When they come up, Revelation 20 verse 9. When they come up on the breath of the earth. That's this army of the wicked. That's Gog and Magog surrounding the city. Let's continue. It says, who come up on the breath of the earth. Read this with care and... You may see that neither Satan nor Gog and Magog are said to hurt or destroy or even enter the beloved city, the camp of the saints. No one that has part in the first resurrection is either tempted or touched. This Gog and Magog are the enemies of God. Where? Without. What does that mean without? Outside the city. They are on the outside of the city. So where should we find ourselves, brothers and sisters? inside of the city you remember what uh, paul says in the book of hebrews they they rejected christ they crucified him outside of the city what city was that jerusalem they rejected him they crucified him outside of the city now the real jerusalem the new jerusalem we will be inside of it with christ and those who rejected him will be on the outside it will be the reverse Oh, because the Bible says, why without Revelation 22? Go to Revelation 22. Notice what Revelation 22 says. Revelation 22, notice in verse 14. Remember what she says again. This Gog and Magog, or what's, what Piney says here, this Gog and Magog are the enemies of God without. Notice what we read in verse Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. Where will the tree of life be? In the city, right? Inside the city, right? And may enter in through the gates into the city. Jerusalem, New Jerusalem. For, without, remember the word without? That means outside. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. They will be without the camp of Israel. I want to be in the city. Don't you? Let's continue. It goes on to say here. In Jewish eschatology, 
Gog and Magog are leaders that had a confederation of enemies who rise against Israel. The little Israel they're talking about. The war will be devastating, but the armies of Gog and Magog will ultimately be defeated by the king of Israel ushering the messianic era. This is what many Protestants are preaching right now. The messiah, the messiah, the messianic Jew will come. It's a deception. Satan is de deceiving the whole world. Let's move on here as we're coming to a close quickly. It says, uh, is Gog and Magog standing behind Hamas in the attack against Israel? They are all saying, promoting this whole lies thing. And this article is from a website, evangelical website by the name of Signs of the Times. The battle of Gog and Magog is the next Bible prophecy on the Bible end time timeline, they say. Gog and Magog is what? Russia as Gog and several of Russia's Arab friends as Magog, like Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Syria, and Lebanon. And don't forget Iran's terrorist group like Hezbollah, operation from the north of Israel and Hamas from the south of Israel. Gog and Magog battle will be one nuclear chemical missile that will be blasted towards Israel in the morning hours, and God will slap it back into Damascus, Syria. Oh, brothers and sisters, uh, the world is being deceived. Next one says, the, the Gaga Magog war, the Russian Islamic invasion of Israel, the timing of the Gaga Magog war against Israel could well be before the emergence of the final world dictator, but after the dispersed people of Israel have been gathered back into their own land and so are safe from hostility within the Gentile nations, i.e. at or near the end of the Aliyah, based on Ezekiel 39. This implies that the true church may well see this invasion before she is taken up in the rapture. No, there's not going to be a church being raptured and not see persecution. We have to experience persecution. We have to show to the world that we have Christ in us and that we have been crucified with him. And it is no longer us that liveth, but Christ who liveth in us. Let's move on. As this went on to say, Gog and Magog are nothing but the wicked raised from the dead who with the devil come up by God's permission to the final execution. And what is that final execution? When will the final execution take place? We're talking about after the thousand years. And then the Bible says, as they encompass the holy city, fire comes down from God and or from heaven and destroy them. That's what we read in Revelation 14, verse 13. It says, Revelation 14, uh, I should say, Yes, Revelation, let's turn there, Revelation 14 and 13, as we're coming to a close. Revelation 13, listen to what it says here. Revelation chapter 13. Remember in verse 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then verse 13 says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works, do follow them. My brothers and my sisters, what each one of us needs to do right now, as we can see the commotions in our world today, these pangs, birth pangs in our world today, we want to make sure that if we were to die today, our works will follow us that Jesus will remember our work, not at the end of the thousand years, but at the beginning of the thousand years. I want to make sure, we want to make sure, we should want God to acknowledge our works now, just in case we were to be laid to rest by death before he comes, so that when the shout come, the voice of, it, of the archangel, with the trump of God, we will recognize it. We will recognize the voice of the master. You see, Jesus says, the hour cometh. 
That's John chapter 5. The hour cometh when all that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God. Some shall come forth to the resurrection of life. Others shall come forth to the resurrection of damnation. There Jesus described two resurrections. A thousand years gap. And if we don't know the voice of God, now we will not recognize His voice when He comes to raise the dead at the first resurrection. Only those who have learned to recognize His voice today will also recognize His voice when He comes the second time. Not the third time, the second time. And how can we make sure, and how can I make sure that I know His voice now, that I become familiar with His voice? By overcoming. By overcoming. Thank you, brother. But also, the Bible says, Today, if you hear His voice, Hebrews chapter 12, harden not your heart. Right? And what does that mean? Well, as God is convicted me, convicting me, convicting you, as His Spirit is speaking to you about your sins, my sins, about anything, then it is now we need to respond to that still small voice. If we keep hardening our heart to that voice, we will not recognize that voice anymore. And so therefore, when he comes the second time with the voice of God, and if, whether we are dead or alive, we will not recognize that voice. To, to the ones who have rejected him, who are in the grave, at the second coming, they will continue to stay sleeping. And the Bible says, do not sleep as do others. To the ones who are alive, at the second coming, but have rejected his voice. To them, the voice of Christ will sound like thunder. And they will say to the rocks and mountains, fall on us. Revelation 6 described this. But to those who love his appearing, to those who have surrendered their lives, who have overcome, as Revelation 15 says and 16 says, they overcome the beast, the mark of the beast, the image of the beast and the number of his name. To those who have learned to overcome, who have learned to surrender to his still small voice, who have been obedient, they will say, this is my God. We have been waiting for him and he will save us. Let's have a word of prayer. Loving Lord, our Father, God, which art in heaven, the battle is raging, is getting even more fierce all around us. But, but at such a time as this, we are reminded it is a spiritual battle. We fight not against flesh and blood, but the battle is really against sin, against self, against Satan. Those are the areas, those are the things we need to overcome. And we need to overcome now because you said in your word, you will come as a thief in the night when we least expect it, when we think that we have more time, that's when we'll come. And for many of us, even in the church, when we think that we have time to do X, Y, Z, then it will be too late. Father, I pray that it will not be the case for any of us here, any of us watching online, that we will learn today to surrender to you, to be part of your army, to find ourselves in the holy city of God, on the inside, not on the outside. Forgive us of all our sins, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.